thank you for the invitation to lecture here this evening. It's a real honor to be here. Um, slightly daunting, I should say, because I'm not a painter, I'm not an artist, and uh, I'm an art historian, so uh, as much as I'm sure everyone would love to hear about how this picture was painted and about the technique, I'm actually not gonna be really talking about that at all. I'm gonna be talking about more of the actual history of why this portrait came about and, and what we know about it as an object. I should also um, preface this by saying that currently the reason I'm working on it is that I'm planning a small book around this portrait. Um, the Frick has begun a series of books about a year ago, which I um, envisioned with our editor-in-chief. And the idea is um, to produce a series of books on individual great works of art at the Frick. Um, and these books are called diptychs, because the idea is that two people collaborate um, on one work of art uh, for one book. And one is an art historian, someone who works at the Frick, a curator who describes and discusses the history of a single work. The other person is someone in the creative world. So it could be a writer, a poet, a filmmaker, a fashion designer, a, an artist, um, a musician, all sorts of different paths and photographer. Um, we have published four. Um, I worked on one on Holbein's Thomas More with Hilary Mantel, the writer. Uh, one on Vermeer's Mistress and Maid, which my colleague Margaret Iacono did with um, the film director James Ivory, who wrote a piece. Uh, one on Gutierrez's Candelabra, which my colleague Charlotte Lignon did with Edmund Duval. And the fourth, which is coming out in the next few weeks, on Rembrandt's Polish Rider, which again I did with Myra Kalman. And we're now working on more. Um, there's going to be one on Constable with William Kentridge, one on Fragonard with Alan Hollinghurst. Um, and we have sort of a long list of names. I mean, one on Monet with uh, Oliver Larsen, um, and so on. So the Aretino one, actually, which should hopefully, if I get it written in time, come out next year, um, is a collaboration with Francine Prose, who has written a short text uh, about Aretino and Titian. As part of this project, also, um, the, the painting has been cleaned, is being cleaned as we speak. And here is a sneak preview of, of almost finished uh, restoration. Uh, Michael Gallagher at the Metropolitan Museum of Art has been uh, beautifully cleaning, restoring this picture. Um, and um, here you see it as it will appear at the Frick when it comes back. Unfortunately, the slides you will see during the lecture tonight are in its previous state as, as a much dirtier picture, but the transformation is underway. And I hope you'll, you can all come to the Frick um, to see it soon. In 1905, as Henry Clay Frick was building his collection of old master paintings in New York City, he acquired a portrait of Pietro Aretino by Titian, which had recently been exhibited in London at the Colnaghi Gallery. Gallery. It was hoped at the time that this portrait could be kept in England. The art critic Roger Fry had published that year an article on Titian's portrait in the Burlington Magazine, the art history journal, which he had helped create two years earlier. Fry concluded his article commenting, it has been suggested that means should be found to acquire this magnificent work for the nation, and already we believe an anonymous and public-spirited donor has offered a large sum towards the price. It is most sincerely to be hoped that others will come forward with the same generosity. The portrait was a celebrated one, since it first appeared in the inventory of the collection of Cardinal Flavio Chigi, who was Pope Alexander VII's nephew on the 1st of May, 1692. It is described as a half-length figure, a portrait of Pietro Aretino by Titian. The painting hung at that time in the Cardinal's palace in Piazza Santi Apostoli in Rome, the present day Palazzo de Scalchi. And you see it uh, above in uh, an engraving. This is how the palace looked at the time that the Aretino portrait was there. Below you see a slightly later engraving and the palace in its present form, and you can notice that it doubled in size. So this was originally a Kiji palace, and then by buying adjacent properties, the next family who owned the Diodescalchis doubled the size of the palace, so it now looks much larger than, than it was. The painting probably did not remain there for very long, as slightly more than 30 years later, in 1725, the Titian was described in another Kiji palace in Rome, on the, Piazza San, on the Piazza Colonna. This had, by this date, become the main residence of the family in Rome. For almost 200 years, Titian's portrait remained in the Chigi Palace, described in all the guidebooks to Rome, 
as one of the most important masterpieces on display in the building. The Kiji family had leased their palace in 1878 to the Austro-Hungarian ambassador and finally sold it to the Italian state in 1916 when it first became the Ministry of Colonial Affairs, then the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and since 1961, the residence and main office of the Italian Prime Minister, which is what it is today still. It was in the early 1900s that the Kiji family sold some of their most important masterpieces, including the Titian, which arrived in London in 1905. Curiously enough, one of the most important Italian art historians of the time, Adolfo Venturi, wrote the most disparaging article on the portrait in September 1905. As a response to Roger Fry's article in the Burlington Magazine, Venturi commented that the supposed portrait by Titian is an object that does not deserve the honor given to it by the English press, and that the Italian press would lament its departure. He described the painting as most miserable, unworthy of the storage of a gallery. Everything in it, according to Venturi, is ugly, diminutive, and false. While Fry was hoping that the portrait could be acquired by England, Venturi sardonically concluded wishing that my country, Italy, should always give similar masterpieces away to foreigners. Venturi's absolute blindness when it came to this portrait allowed for it to leave Italy, and by the end of that year, the painting was on its way across the Atlantic and reached New York. On January 9, 1906, Henry Clay Frick paid $90,000 for the canvas, which he purchased from the art dealer Nudler and between April and October of that year, he lent it to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It cannot be a coincidence that that same year, Roger Fry was appointed curator of European paintings at the Metropolitan, and he was probably instrumental in Frick's loan of the portrait to the museum. Since 1915, after Frick's new mansion at 1 East 70th Street, designed by Thomas Hastings, was completed, Titian's portrait has been on display in the living hall, flanking Giovanni Bellini's great St. Francis in the Desert, together with another much earlier portrait of an unknown man, also by Titian, which Frick, Frick acquired later in 1915, the same year he moved with his family into the house. And there you see the two portraits flanking the Bellini on the wall. For more than 100 years, the portrait has been one of the glories of the Frick collection and one of the most important Venetian portraits there. Portrayed half-length in a three-quarter pose, the sitter in Titian's canvas appears absorbed in his own thoughts. Middle-aged and balding, his beard is graying and unapologetically long. He wears a particularly rich outfit made of orange gilt satin and probably marten fur. Over it, a large gold chain is prominently displayed. The sitter is placed against a neutral gray background and his formidable features and luxurious clothes are the only two features Titian decided to focus on. As Fry remarked in 1905, here we have Aretino in his friend's studio without self-consciousness, without pose, and without reserve, abstracted for a moment in a mood of equable reverie, which allows one to see the whole man with no one aspect so emphasized as to disturb the balance. Among the many portraits painted by Titian over almost 70-year career, those of Aretino hold a special place, as the relationship between the painter and the sitter was a particularly close one. As Sheila Hale, who recently wrote a substantial biography on Titian, observed, Aretino became the closest companion of Titian's life, his most sensitive critic, as well as his advisor, agent, publicist, debt collector, scribe, and hanger-on. He broadcast Titian's talent to the world in his plays, sonnets, and more than 225 published letters, while using his friend's growing international reputation to gain entree and gather information for his journalism. The Frick portrait of Aretino is the main focus of tonight's lecture, and in exploring its history and the relationship between Titian and Aretino, I would also like to emphasize and bring to your attention a third figure, the man who most likely commissioned the portrait. But let's start with Aretino. Pietro Aretino was famously described by Ludovico Ariosto in the Orlando Furioso as il flagello dei principi, the scourge of princes, and was one of the most celebrated literary figures of the first half of the 16th century in Italy. He was an astonishing character whose career is arduous to describe easily and whose interests were multiform and complex. He was an author and a writer of both prose and poetry, of both secular and religious subjects. The range of his topics 
of the topics he focused on in his writings go from the life of Christ and the saints on one hand to, the, to, the, to those of prostitutes and stable boys on the other. He was an arrogant man, but often capable of incredible generosity. He was absolutely self-centered, yet always interested in what was happening around him. A man whose personal interests always took center stage, but who was also a long-standing and faithful friend. He wrote compulsively about everything around him, was a prolific letter writer, possibly the first journalist, a theater author, an impresario, and a pornographer. His personal life was equally colorful, and his sexual excesses were directed in equal manner towards girls and boys, often lamenting at the same time the loss of a beloved girlfriend and a beloved boyfriend. The young targets of his interest became quickly known in Venice and Italy as the Aretine and Aretini, the Aretino girls and the Aretino boys. Rulers, aristocrats, literary figures, and artists were all equally interested in being praised in writing by Aretino and correspondingly terrified of his attacks. Aretino's pen was unvaryingly responsible for his acquisitions of both friends and foes. Pietro's name, Aretino, defined him as a citizen of the Tuscan town of Arezzo. He was born there on the April 20th, 1492, the son of a woman called Margherita Bonci. Little is known about his parents, but they clearly came from a destitute background. Aretino describes himself as being di basso sangue, of low blood. His father was probably a shoemaker, a calzolaio, probably either named Luca or Andrea, who seems to have abandoned his family very early on, and with whom Pietro had no relationship throughout his life. Many legends, mostly circulated by his enemies, later appeared in print dealing with Aretino's youth. His mother was close to the noble Bacci family, and in particular to a man called Luigi Bacci, and it is often said that Pietro was the illegitimate son of the aristocrat, even though it seems more likely that Margherita began the affair with Bacci after her shoemaker husband had left her. The link to the Bacci family proved to be fundamental for Pietro's life, as the humble son of a shoemaker ended up receiving an aristocratic education alongside the other Bacci children in Arezzo. By 1510, the 22-year-old Pietro was in Perugia with the humanist Francesco Bontempi and getting involved in the literary circles of that city. Two years later, in 1512, he published his first poems in the city. While in Perugia, he also became closely associated with the painter Giovanni Battista Caporali, the son of another painter, Bartolomeo Caporali. Giovanni Battista, a minor painter in the orbit of Perugino and Pinturicchio, affectionately nicknamed by Retino Bitte, according to some early sources, also taught the young Pietro how to paint. And in some early documents, Aretino describes himself as an artist and painter. It is clear that from a young age, Aretino's interests in literature and art went hand in hand. Around 1517, the young Pietro moved to Rome, and there he was immediately adopted in the cultural circles of the rich Sienese banker Agostino Chigi. Between 1509 and 1511, Chigi had built a spectacular small villa on the banks of the river Tiber, following designs by Baldassare Peruzzi, which later became known as La Farnesina. Chigi had invited many of the most prominent artists in Rome at the time to fresco the rooms of the building, and in the second decade of the 16th century, Raphael, Sebastiano del Piombo, and Sodoma were all at work in the banker's residence. Around 1511 to 12, Raphael painted for Chigi his celebrated triumph of Galatea. And soon after Aretino's arrival in Rome and his entry in the refined world of Agostino Chigi and the Farnesina circles, Raphael and his workshop were at work on the magnificent main loggia on the ground floor of the building, frescoed with scenes from the story of Cupid and Psyche. Aretino entered rapidly the whirlwind of literary figures of Rome at the time and quickly got to know the greatest artists at work in the city such as Raphael, but also Giovanni da Udine, Giulio Romano, Sebastian del Piombo, Michelangelo, and Jacopo Sansovino, and became a close friend of many of them. Rome at the time was witnessing a golden age for the arts, under the patronage of the Medici Pope Leo X. And here you see the Pope in his portrait by Raphael. Aretino, probably because of his Tuscan origins, quickly moved within the papal circles and became close to Leo's nephew, Cardinal Giulio de' Medici, who you see on the left of the Pope, his uncle. The death of Leo X on November 24th, 1521, allowed for Aretino's wit to be broadly publicized, but also was the cause of his first social downfall at the papal court. In 
Already from the early 16th century, the custom of attaching satirical verses to an ancient sculpture near Piazza Navona, known jokingly as Pasquino, had become a common practice. And here you see a 16th century print showing the sculpture with um, text attached to it. And you see it today where people still attach um, satirical text against Italian politician mainly to it. During the conclave following Leo X's death, Aretino composed a series of satirical texts known as Pasquinat, Pasquinate, mostly in support of Cardinal Giulio de' Medici, who he was hoping would become the next pope. However, a northern cardinal, Adrian Florence from Utrecht, who had been Emperor Charles V's tutor and had never been to Rome previously, was surprisingly elected pope and took the name of Adrian VI. Before the new pope arrived in July 1522, Aretino quickly left Rome. For the next year, Pietro traveled around Italy and visited the court of Federico Gonzaga, the Duke of Mantua, you see his portrait on the left, and traveled in the service of the dead pope's cousin, Giovanni de' Medici, on the right, known because of the uniform of his mercenary army as Giovanni dalle Bande Nere, Giovanni of the Black Bands. But Adrian VI's reign was fortunately a short-lived one, and the northern pope died in September 1523, having ruled slightly more than one year. Giulio de' Medici was elected pope and took the name of Clement VII. Aretino immediately returned to Rome, seeking the new pope's patronage. By this date, Aretino was an elegant courtier and a known author. His presence at the court of Mantua and in the retinue of Giovanni dalle Bande Nere had provided him with added celebrity. Probably around this time, if not earlier in Rome, Marcantonio Raimondi produced a printed portrait of Aretino, following a design by either Sebastiano del Piombo or Giulio Romano. In it, Pietro appears as the elegant courtiers and man about town, and it seems that his career was off to a very impressive start. However, around this time, Aretino encountered one of his first bitter enemies, the powerful papal datory Giovanni Matteo Giberti, Bishop of Verona. In the spring of 1524, the printmaker Marcantonio Raimondi was arrested in Rome, following Giberti's orders for having printed 16 obscene images known as i modi, the ways, or positions, following Giulio Romano's designs. It seems that Aretino was involved with this production and soon 16 sonetti lussuriosi, lustful sonnets, appeared to accompany Giulio and Marcantonio's images. And incidentally, this is the only 16th century copy of this book with both the prints and the text that survives. And it's actually not entirely complete because two pages are missing, but it's as complete as it can be. By that date, Giulio had wisely left Rome and Giberti ordered the plates for the prints to be destroyed. Aretino managed to help Marcantonio to be, to be absolved, but the episode was the beginning of a bitter hatred that would last for years. Pietro continued in his criticism of Giberti, and this resulted on the night between the 28th and 29th of July, 1525, in an attempt on Aretino's life in Rome. Riding through the city at night, Pietro was attacked by a man, Achille della Volta, who stabbed him twice in the chest and multiple times in his hands. In the attack, Aretino's right hand was badly disfigured and he lost two fingers. Left for dead, news of the attack traveled around Italy. But only a month later, Aretino was fully cured, and in October 1525, he wisely left Rome for good. He returned to serve Giovanni dalle Bande Nere as a secretary, but even this experience was a very short-lived one, as the condottiere died in 1526, and even the subsequent stay in Mantua at the court of Federico Gonzaga was very brief. Lamenting the end of love affairs in Mantua with Isabella Sforza and with a young boy, son of a certain Bianchino, in March 1527, Aretino moved to Venice. Aretino was to spend the last 26 years of his life in Venice. And here you see the two houses in which he was documented as living. Uh, it's the second house, the one to the left of the Red House near the Rialto Bridge, and another one um, further up on the Grand Canal that you see here on the right on, on the corner. Away from the courtly world of Rome and Mantua, Pietro was delighted by the freedom and intellectual stimulation of Venice and remained in the city for the rest of his life. There was a possibility at one point to move to France in the service of King Francis I and an ill-fated attempt to procure himself a cardinal's hat in Rome. But otherwise, Pietro was firmly established as one of the principal literary figures in Venice. Here he published many of his most celebrated works the books on La Humanità di Cristo, The Humanity of Christ in 1535, and The Ragionamenti, a text in which Aretino, 
analyze the lives of nuns, married women, and courtesans, only to conclude that the most honest choice of life for a woman between the three was that of a courtesan. In 1537, he started publishing his letters, which continued to be printed until 1557, when a six volume was posthumously printed. His portrait in these years appeared in woodcuts on so many of these publications, making his features well known throughout Europe. At the same time, medals by artists such as Leone Leoni and Alessandro Vittoria were also produced and widely circulated. Aretino's love life flourished in his Venetian years and Caterina Sandelli became his life companion. With Caterina, Aretino had two daughters, Adria, who was born in 1537, and Adria's name refers to the Adriatic and to Venice, and the second daughter was called Austria, in reference to Austria and the emperor, and she was born 10 years later. Adria married in 1549 and moved to Urbino, while Austria lived with her father until his death. Caterina's presence, however, did not stop Aretino from having important affairs with other people, with Pierina Ricci, who died of tuberculosis in 1545, leaving the writer distraught, and then with Angela Serena. Aretino died in his house in Venice on October 21, 1556, of a heart attack. It was said at the time that he collapsed while laughing at a particularly good joke. He was buried a few days later in the church of San Luca, and here's the church. We actually don't know where he was buried in the church, but he is in there somewhere. While in Venice, Aretino developed a strong friendship with the most celebrated painter in the city, if not in Europe, at the time, Titian. And the two remained close until Aretino's death. Together with the sculptor Sansovino, they were seen as a cultural triumvirate in the city. Aretino wrote extensively about Titian's art, and Titian, on his part, portrayed Aretino a number of times. On two occasions, Aretino made cameo appearances in Titian's paintings. And this is the game Spot Aretino. Around 1540, Aretino was portrayed as one of the soldiers in the allocution of Alfonso d'Avalos, the Marquis del Vasto, now at the Prado. It is unlikely that Aretino provided his features for the halberdier in the foreground, as it is often said, and it is much more likely that instead that he is among the faces in the crowd of soldiers in the background. And if you look exactly to the left of the halibard, there is a man in profile with a beard, and that seems to be Aretino. Only three years later, around 1543, Aretino appears as Pontius Pilate in the large Ecce Homo, now in the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna. And there you see him at the top of the stairs next to Christ. But apart from these two appearances, Aretino was portrayed by Titian at least three times in independent portraits. We know from contemporary sources that also a number of other artists portrayed Aretino at different times, including Sebastiano del Piombo, Moretto, Francesco Salviati, and Jacopo Tintoretto. The first of Titian's portraits was probably commissioned soon after Aretino arrived in Venice in March 1527. On June 22nd of that year, Titian wrote to Federico Gonzaga to accompany his portrait of Aretino, which he was sending to him. The portrait was probably intended as a gift to encourage further patronage from the Duke of Mantua for both artist and sitter. The painting is described in the early 17th century by Ridolfi. He, Titian, portrayed him, Aretino, with a black cap on his head, embroidered with plume tasseled, held by a gold medal with the motto Fides, which had been given to him by the Duke of Mantua and in his right hand he held a crown of laurel. Considered lost until very recently, I proposed recently that this portrait in the Kunstmuseum in Basel in Switzerland is actually a fragment of Titian's lost portrait for the Duke of Mantua. Almost 20 years later, in 1545, Titian painted Aretino's portrait again. This canvas was destined for another ruler of the time, Duke Cosimo I de' Medici of Florence, the son of Aretino's old patron, Giovanni dalle Bande Nere. In April 1545, Aretino wrote to Paolo Giovio, who had asked for his portrait for his collection of images of famous men, apologizing for not being able to send the portrait by Titian, as it was intended for Cosimo. Instead, Aretino wrote he would send Giovio a copy of that painting. In October 1545, Titian's portrait was sent to Florence. Aretino, however, did not seem to like the painting. In a letter to Titian that month, he complained that the portrait had been piuttosto abbozzato che fornito, somewhat sketched rather than finished. And before the painter traveled to Rome, 
in, in a letter to Duke Cosimo accompanying the painting to Florence, Aretino grumbled about Titian's stylistic choices. He described the portrait as an image that certainly breathes, it, its wrist pulse and move the spirit as I do in life. But Pietro remarked bitterly that if he had paid Titian more, maybe the draperies in the portrait would have been shiny, soft, and stiff as satin, velvet, and brocade really are. The portrait nevertheless, in its glorious use of reds, in its, might, it, in its mighty effect, even if it is easy to understand Aretino's disappointment in the broadly sketched sleeves of the outfit, is, is a great painting. Peering under the heavy scarlet coat is a gold chain. In fact, we know that this portrait was sent to the Duke of, um, of Florence, but the Grand Duke, but it was actually never seen by the Grand Duke. Um, it has been recently brought to light a whole series of very interesting letters. Aretino keeps writing to the Duke, asking him if he's received the portrait, and he never gets a letter back. And that is because the secretary of the Duke at that time, who was favoring Bronzino, a Florentine painter, had hidden the portrait and all the letters from Aretino because he didn't want the Duke to ask Titian to do his portrait rather than Bronzino. So it's a sort of rather interesting um, political um, sort of conspiracy behind this portrait, which then appears in the Medici collection much later on. So going back to the gold chain, we know that Aretino received three gold chains during his life, which he himself mentioned in one of his letters. And of course, gold chains were great gifts, not only for their monetary value, but for the prestige of who was receiving them and, and who they were given by. The first was from the King of France, Francis I, Another from the Empress, Isabella of Portugal, Charles V's wife, and the third from Cardinal Ippolito de' Medici. Which of the three is represented in this portrait is impossible to determine. It is likely that it is the French one for a number of reasons, but we don't actually know. After Aretino's death, it was said that the gold chain given to him by the King of France was used to pay for his funeral. But friendlier sources instead claim that the chain was broken up to provide gold for the poor of Venice. The third of the known independent portraits by Titian of Aretino is mentioned in Vasari's Life of the Painter in the 1568 edition of The Lives. And for Francesco Marcolini, he did a portrait of Pietro Aretino, though this was not as fine as another he did of the same subject, which Aretino himself sent as a gift to Duke Cosimo de' Medici. And of course, here is always Vasari's bias for anything Florentine. So just by the fact that Titian had got to Florence, it was more important than anything else that had remained in Venice. Roger Fry, in 1905, was the first to connect the Frick portrait with this mention by Vasari. And since then, the New York portrait has been associated with the painting for Marcolini. It is actually impossible to be certain that this is the picture mentioned by Vasari painted for Marcolini, since we do not know where Cardinal Fabio Chigi acquired the portrait. But unless we assume that the Marcolini portrait is now lost and that the Frick portrait was painted for another anonymous, undocumented patron, it still seems most likely that the Frick portrait of Aretino at the Frick was indeed painted for Marcolini. While both of Titian's previous images of Aretino were created in an attempt to, to, on the part of the writer to seek favor at the courts of Mantua and Florence, and in both cases the attempt proved to be absolutely futile, the portrait for Marcolini was the result of a more personal relationship, that between an author and his publisher. The figure of Marcolini is still somewhat elusive and worthy of further study, and that's something I'm very interested in these days. But by examining his life and career, it becomes apparent that his role in Venice was a very vital one in the intellectual circles of Aretino and Titian. Francesco Marcolini was born in Forlì at the end of the 15th century, or possibly in the early 1500s. Not much is known about his life in Romagna, but we know that he traveled to Venice around 1527, probably around exactly the same time when Aretino moved there. He worked in Venice as a bookseller, but seven years later, in 1534, he first appears in his role as publisher. Marcolini's debut as a publisher coincided with the appearance of three books by Aretino that same year, La Cortigiana, The Passione di Gesù, and I Sette Salmi della Penitenza di David. The three volumes were published all by Marcolini, but printed by Giovanni Antonio Nicolini da Sebbio. A year later, another book by Aretino, I Tre Libri dell'Umanità di Cristo, was again published by Marcolini, 
By the time two of Aretino's works, La Cortigiana and the Passione di Gesù, were reprinted in that year, it seems that Marcolini had ceased to use an external printer and already founded his own printing establishment in Venice. For a brief time, around 1536, Marcolini's publishing house was located near the church of Santi Apostoli, in La Contrada Santo Apostolo, nella Casa dei Frati dei Crosacchieri. But soon after, he moved to another building near the Church of the Trinity at Castello. During a decade, from the mid-1530s to the mid-1540s, Marcolini's publishing house flourished in Venice, and its best-selling author was Aretino. Between first editions and reprintings, Marcolini was involved with 35 books by Aretino. In 1545, Marcolini left Venice and moved to Cyprus. The reasons for this decision remain unknown and rather mysterious. He remained there until 1548, when he returned to, to Venice. So he was in Cyprus for three years. His wife, Isabella, died while in Cyprus, and Marcolini only began publishing again in 1550 in Venice. It seems that by this date, his friendship with Aretino had substantially cooled down. Aretino's enemies implied that the writer had an illicit affair with Marcolini's wife, and that was the reason for the publisher's move to Cyprus. But it seems to be a rather far-fetched possibility. We know that in August 1548, Aretino had written to Marcolini in Cyprus to invite him back to Venice and to offer condolences for Isabella's death. The letter is a warm one and no strain between the two men can be detected from it. And it has even been suggested that Marcolini went to Cyprus to kill his unfaithful wife away from Venice, but that doesn't seem to have been the case. In the 1550s, however, Marcolini became close to another literary figure, Anton Francesco Doni, one of Aretino's most rancorous enemies in Venice. Marcolini published his works, and Aretino seems to have somewhat distanced himself from his old friend and publisher. Marcolini died around 1559, three years after his most celebrated author. The two were exact contemporaries. During his 26 years of activity, Marcolini published 130 volumes. Aretino and Doni were not, were, were not his only authors, but among the many others were not only prose writers and poets, but also architects, such as Sebastiano Serlio. In a letter of September 18th, 1537, Aretino had written to Marcolini praising Serlio. He mentioned in his letter that his own volume of letters had to wait to be published as Marcolini was focusing on printing Serlio's Architectura treatise. Marcolini's books were praised for the quality of their illustrations, often provided by the painter Giuseppe Porta Salviati, but it has been suggested that on occasion Marcolini may have also used, uh, may have also used his own designs for woodcuts. Two of the most celebrated emblems that appear in Marcolini's frontispieces were probably designed by another artist, Francesco Salviati, as it has recently been proposed by Enrico Parlato. One represents, on the left, truth uh, saved by time from fraud and was accompanied by a Latin motto, veritas filia temporis, truth is the daughter of time. The other instead showed truth being crowned by victory while she steps over a satyr. And another inscription accompanies the image, veritas odium parit, truth breeds hatred. These emblems were used by Marcolini in his books, but also often by Aretino himself. For example, the veritas odium parit emblem appears both in Marcolini's frontispieces and books, and on the reverse of an anonymous medal of Aretino. The relationship between Marcolini and Aretino was particularly clo a particularly close one. Many letters between the two survive, and Aretino referred to his publisher as compare, friend, and fratello, brother. The two seem to have exchanged lavish and constant gifts. Aretino was writing to Marcolini on June 3rd, 1537, thanking him for the gifts of flowers, vegetables, and expensive fruit. Aretino mentioned Marcolini's gifts of objects that come from the hands of good nature and art. Escono di mano alla buona natura e l'arte. Marcolini had sent Aretino artichokes, cucumbers, orange flowers, violet, pinks, roses, almonds, strawberries, figs, and other fruits. He also sent his publisher expensive glasses, oil, toothpicks, and soap. 
In August 1538, Aretino was praising Marcolini to Bernardo Teodolo. Marcolini's, I quote, soul is so similar to mine that one day he will donate himself in the same way that I would have donated myself if there were people who would be willing to accept such a low gift. When Aretino's daughter Adria was born, her father chose two godfathers for her, the painter Sebastiano del Piombo and Marcolini. Marcolini also acted as the godfather for another of Aretino's daughters who died as a child. That Titian painted Aretino's portrait for Marcolini is proved not only by Vasari's mention in the lives, but also by another letter from Marcolini to Aretino in September 15, 1551. In this letter, Marcolini praised the portrait of Aretino by the painter and stated, uh, sorry, and started by listing the two that were in the collections of the Duke of Mantua and the Duke of Tuscany. He also mentioned in passing other portraits of Aretino by Sebastiano del Piombo, Salviati, and Tintoretto. Among the works listed in the letter is also Aretino's medal by Leone Leoni, the medal in which Cavalier Leoni, my friend, has printed you in my house, del concio dove Cavalier Leoni, il mio compare, have impresso in casa mia. It is unclear if the reference to Marcolini's house means that the publisher owned a copy of the medal, or if the medal was physically struck by Leoni in the book publisher's printing facilities, which may sound strange, but it did happen often. Uh, the machinery for printing books and for striking medals, surprisingly, could be used in similar ways. Most of the letter, however, understandably, deals with the Titian portrait of Aretino owned by Marcolini himself. The publisher claims in the letter that the painting was commissioned by him, a richiesta mia, and that it was painted by Titian in three days. Marcolini claimed that he would keep the portrait as an idol to signify the reverence in which he and the world kept Aretino, and he concluded that I will always keep it while I will remain alive, leaving it by inheritance to my heirs. Who Marcolini's heirs were is not known, and how the portrait passed after Marcolini's death around 1559 to the Chigi family in Rome later in the 17th century still remains to be established. Even more problematic is the date of the painting. In the letter, Marcolini stated, referring to the portrait, that those who knew you at the time see you in flesh and soul, now looking at the portrait. It is clear that the portrait must have been commissioned before 1551, when the letter was written. But it is unclear, however, if the Frick Marcolini portrait postdates the Florence one, 1545, and was therefore created for Marcolini after he returned for Cyprus, or if it is, more likely, earlier than 1545, and um, therefore predates Marcolini's trip to Cyprus. In any case, the reference to that time in the letter suggests a significant gap in time, which could have ranged between three and 15 years. The two portraits appear to be rather different, the ones in Florence and the one at the Frick. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. But in fact, they share significant compositional choices. The two canvases are almost identical in size. In both, Titian represents Aretino in the same pose. Aretino's right hand, which was probably severely disfigured in the 1525 attack in Rome, is hidden behind his back, his left hand in both painting covered by a glove. It seems that Titian started from the same composition only to alter the color and type of costume worn by Aretino and, most importantly, the position of the head. The similarities in composition suggest that Titian painted the two works close to each other in time or depending on each other in some way, and Aretino appears in both of them of a similar age, if probably somewhat younger, probably in the Frick portrait. Marcolini's letter to Aretino of 1551 demonstrates Marcolini's interest in the arts. Not only he had commissioned Titian's portrait of Aretino, but he also owned other works of art. In the letter, he refers to two statues by Jacopo Sansovino that he owned. I could not have believed that other figures by his hand could have reached the beauty of the Mars and the Minerva by him, which I keep as a miracle in my house, gifts of his great kindness. With these two statu what these two statues were is unclear. Around 1550, Sansovino was at work on two monumental marble statues of Mars and Neptune for the main staircase, the Scala dei Giganti, of the Doge's Palace in Venice. And you see the Mars here on the left. And at the same time, a series of bronze sculptures, including a Minerva on the right, 
for the loggetta of the Campanile, the bell tower of St. Mark's. It is possible that Marcolini owned sketches, modelli, or similar versions or replicas of these two statues. In any case, we know from the 1551 letter that Marcolini owned Titian's portrait of Aretino, two sculptures by Sansovino, and possibly a medal by Leone Leoni. This strongly suggests that the publisher's interest in the arts was much more substantial than previously proposed. As part of the relationship between Titian, Aretino, and Marcolini, a fourth fascinating character must, at this point, be brought in. In the early 1540s, Aretino befriended a young and brilliant aristocratic scholar, Daniele Barbaro. He was born in Venice in 1514, the son of parents from two of the most aristocratic families in Venice at the time. His mother was a Pisani. And Barbaro studied in Padua in, in, in 1540, and he was among the founders of the Accademia degli Infiammati. The 1540s were an important decade for this young man as he started publishing his work and became close to the older Aretino. Young Daniele Barbaro was interested in literature, in poetry, in philosophy, Aristotle in particular, science and architecture. In 1545 to 46, he designed the botanical gardens in Padua and quickly became one of the most significant Venetian intellectuals of the mid 16th century. Aretino was fascinated by Barbaro and took him under his wings. On May 6, 1542, Aretino, in a letter to Barbaro, praised his skills, the reasoning of Aristotle, the ideas of Plato, the teachings of Socrates, the inventions of Homer, the arts of Cicero, and the senses of Augustine, together with everything that is expressed by those that the world calls wise men, are the spirits that move your pen, the pen of your intellect. In another letter from Aretino to a doctor named Macassola of January 1544, he referred to Messer Daniele Barbaro, a youth renowned, serious, and unsurpassed whom I love adore and admire. Around the mid-1540s, Barbaro was portrayed by Titian twice in two identical portraits, now at the Museo del Prado in Madrid on the left and at the National Gallery of Canada in Ottawa on the right. The second one was sent to the collector Paolo Giovio and hung in his gallery of portraits of celebrated men. Giovio, if you remember, had previously also asked Aretino for a version of his Titian portrait the one made for Duke Cosimo de' Medici. By the 1550s, Daniele Barbaro was a successful Venetian aristocrat. Between the summer of 1549 and the spring of 1550, he was Venetian ambassador to London at the court of King Edward VI. When he returned to Venice, he was appointed patriarch elect of Aquileia in May 1550. The patriarch's position, the preeminent ecclesiastical role in the Venetian Republic, was at the time taken by Giovanni Grimani, Barbaro was nominated to follow him as patriarch after Grimani's death. As it turned out, Barbaro waited his entire life for this position, and when he died on April 13, 1570, Grimani was still alive at the age of 64, and only died 23 years later in 1593. Barbaro therefore remained frozen in his potential role, which never materialized. This actually allowed him to pursue his intellectual interests and to become a patron of the arts. Around 1553, he was commissioned to devise the iconography for the ceiling of three rooms for the Council of Ten in the Doge's Palace. Barbaro provided a brilliant iconographical scheme for the three painters at work on the ceiling, Giambattista Ponchino, Battista Zelotti, and the young Paolo Veronese. Barbaro's interest in the arts found its culmination in the commission, together with his brother Marcantonio, of a villa in the small town of Maser, near Venice. The building was designed in the late 1550s by Andrea Palladio, probably following the Barbaro brothers' instructions and, and advice. In 1554, Barbaro had been to Rome together with Palladio to study ancient buildings and ruins, and the two remained particularly close. The Villa Barbaro at Maser was entirely decorated by Paolo Veronese, who by the early 1560s was the young painter from Verona who had become the favorite of many aristocratic families in Venice the Barbaro and Pisani above all. Among the frescoes in the villa and among the fictive marble sculptures that Veronese painted on the walls, the humorous portraits of Marcantonio and Daniele were also included with the attributes of grapes and a liar, identifying Marcantonio on the left as Bacchus and Daniele on the right as Apollo. And this, of course, in a way, 
distinguished the two brothers, Marc Antonio, who was looking after the farming and the, the, the cultivation of the villa at, at Maser, and um, Daniele as Apollo for his intellectual pursuits. Barbaro's great passion among many intellectual pursuits, however, was architecture. In 1552, Giuseppe Porta Salviati published a book entitled the, role to perf the Rule sorry, to Perfectly Design with Dividers, the Volutes of Ionic Capitals and Other Types. This book was published by Marcolini and dedicated to Barbaro. From the mid-1540s, Barbaro had been at work on his own masterpiece, the translation from Latin into Italian of Vitruvius's treatise on architecture. Barbaro worked on it for almost a decade, and the book appeared in 1556 and was entitled I Dieci Libri dell'Architettura di Vitruvio, The Ten Books of Architecture by Vitruvius, Tradotti e Commentati da Monsignor Barbaro, Eletto Patriarca d'Aquileggia, translated and commentated by Monsignor Barbaro, Patriarch Elect of Aquileia. The book was exceptional for its lavish illustrations throughout the volume. The publisher, of course, was Francesco Marcolini. Barbaro was helped in this project by Palladio, but throughout the volume, he mentions another person who had been instrumental in aiding him with the translation from Latin, the publisher Marcolini. As we have seen, Marcolini was, uh, sorry, was not only a book publisher, but also an art lover. He was also interested in architecture and practiced as an architect himself. As with many other 16th century figures, he was a man of different and wide-ranging interests and an amateur in various fields, including art and architecture. We learn from a letter of July 1545 from Aretino to Jacopo Sansovino that around that time, Marcolini had designed a wooden bridge for one of the canals in Murano. Aretino praised it generously. Our own Messer Francesco with such superb structure has given body and soul to Murano. In the 1540s, Aretino had become the preeminent writer for the Marcolini publishing house until Marcolini's trip to Cyprus in 1545. But by the 1550s, after Marcolini's return to Venice, Barbaro quickly became one of Marcolini's most important authors. The Barbaro Vitruvius can be seen as Marcolini's last editorial masterpiece before his death in 1559. In the second half, of the 1550s, Daniele Barbaro was portrayed for the second time, this time not by Titian, but by Paolo Veronese. As much as Titian was the iconographer of Aretino, Veronese became the iconographer of Barbaro. The magnificent portrait, which is now in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, remains the most famous image of the Venetian intellectual. Barbaro is shown seated, wearing his ecclesiastical outfit as patriarch elect of Aquileia, he sits against an architectural background and next to a table. On it are placed a metal armillary sphere, and in front of it are two books. Both are, in fact, copies of his translation of Vitruvius, as published by Marcolini in 1556. The portrait must therefore postdate the publication of the book, and the late 1550s fit stylistically with Veronese's career. On the table, Barbaro holds open one of the two copies of the book, showing its frontispiece. Of course, the frontispiece in the actual book appears on the right page, but for compositional reasons, Veronese transposes it to the left page. We can be sure that this is the frontispiece of the first edition, as by the time the second edition was published in 1567, the architectural structure in the frontispiece was somewhat altered, and there was a different, um, old, different frontispiece. The book behind also shows two of the woodcuts included in Barbaro's Vitruvius, again, not actually in the right order as they appear in the book. On the right page is part of page 69 of Vitruvius, showing the facade of the temple. Sorry. Uh, no, I'm going back. Sorry, the facade of the temple in Antis from book three. And on the left, instead, is the first page of book nine on clocks and sundials showing a sundial. Recently, Duncan Ball, who is the curator at the Rijksmuseum, has published a brilliant article on this portrait. In it, he noted for the first time that Barbaro's studies on sundials were quickly superseded by a book by a guy called Franci Federico Comandino in 1562. Duncan Ball rightly argued that Veronese would have not painted in the portrait an illustration from Barbaro's book that would have referred to an out-of-fashion out scholarship, 
While many art historians have dated this portrait by Veronese to the mid and later 1560s and even to the 1570s, Bull argues convincingly that the portrait cannot be dated after 1562. He therefore places the portrait between 1556 and the early 1560s. While Veronese scholars over the years have debated the possible date of the Barbaro portrait, what no one has ever questioned is who the painting was painted for. This is a particularly complex issue, as we do not know where the portrait was before 1929, when it first appeared in the collection of a Swiss surgeon, Otto Lanz, in Amsterdam. Lanz himself published the portrait as belonging to his own collection in the Burlington Magazine in, 20, in 1929, claiming that he had acquired it many years ago after he saw the canvas in a private collection in Basel, Switzerland. The previous owner apparently also owned with the painting a handwritten 18th century note describing the portrait and its sitter, which was addressed to a certain Samuel Hensler or Hausler of Basel. Hensler may have been a previous owner of the painting, and it seems that the portrait was already in the Swiss city 200 years before Lanz acquired it. How the portrait traveled from Venice to Basel remains unknown, and no information on the painting predates the 18th century. What I would propose, in light of the relationship between Titian, Aretino, Marcolini, and Barbaro, is that Veronese's portrait of Daniele Barbaro, like Titian's portrait of Aretino, was also painted for Francesco Marcolini. There is no documentary evidence for this proposal, but the intellectual context around the portraits would make this proposal possible. No inventory of Marcolini's possession survives, but we do know he owned, as we've seen, at least Titian's portrait of Aretino, probably the Frick one, the two sculptures by Sansovino, and probably the medal by Leoni. We know that he commissioned Titian's portrait of Aretino and was therefore wealthy enough to acquire a portrait by a significant artist. By the mid-1550s, Barbaro had become Marcolini's most prominent author, and the Vitruvius volume was one of the triumphs of Marcolini's publishing career. It seems obvious that if Marcolini had a portrait of Aretino which he had commissioned, he would have also liked to own one of Barbaro as well. Marcolini could have therefore owned two, if not more, portraits of his writers, creating a collection of his author's portraits. Therefore, Marcolini may have commissioned Veronese to paint the portrait of Barbaro soon after 1556, when the Vitruvius translation was published, and before 1559, when Marcolini died. At this time, Veronese already knew Barbaro well and was in the process of beginning the frescoes at Maser. It cannot be excluded, however, that the painting was commissioned by Barbaro himself as a gift to Marcolini. Barbaro knew Aretino well as a young man and knew about his portrait by Titian, two of which were painted in the 1540s when the young Barbaro was particularly close to Aretino. Barbaro may have witnessed Titian painting them and certainly knew the Frick portrait in Marcolini's house. Barbaro would have also understood the importance Aretino gave to his own image and how he promoted it with gifts of portraits to various rulers. Immediately after the publication of his own masterpiece, Barbaro could have thanked Marcolini with a gift such as the Veronese portrait. The options of Marcolini's commission of the painting or of Barbaro's commission as a gift to Marcolini are both possible. But in any case, it seems that the first owner of the canvas could indeed have been Marcolini. To me, the most convincing proof of this matter and the evidence for this proposal is in the painting itself. Daniele Barbaro holds his book open and what the viewer can see are some of the woodcuts that made the book particularly lavish. This is a portrait of an author, an intellectual, but it's at the same time, it could be argued, a portrait of a very specific book. Barbaro's hand is on the title page, but when illustrating a title page in the portrait of an author, we would expect the title itself to appear and the name of the author and the writer. As you can see, Veronese depicts the title page in the bottom part. Neither Barbaro's name nor Vitruvius, not even the title of the work, are visible. What is clearly visible is the line at the bottom of the page, the line that proclaims that the book was published by Francesco Marcolini in Venice in 1556. Barbaro's thumb is placed immediately after Marcolini's name, clearly pointing to him. To conclude, the Frick Collection's portrait of Titian is a witness to the relationship between a writer, Aretino, and his publisher, Marcolini. Through Titian's art, we are able to reconstruct an important intellectual network in Renaissance Venice. And it is exactly by exploring this network that the name of Daniele Barbaro can be connected to Aretino, Titian, and Marcolini. And that we're able to examine Veronese's portrait of Barbaro in Amsterdam under a different light. <laughs>
if Titian's portrait of Aretino at the Frick hung in Marcolini's house by the Church of the Trinity at Castello, near Veronese's portrait of Daniele Barbaro, we're not able to say with absolute certainty today. We do not know who Marcolini's descendants were, and we do not know how the Titian portrait reached the Chigi collection in Rome in the 17th century, or how the Veronese portrait arrived in Basel in the 18th century. More research needs to be carried out on Marcolini as a patron and collector, but both portraits stand to witness to posterity the importance of the intellectual circles of Venice in the 16th century. Aretino, the libertine playwright, poet, literary figure, and blackmailer, and Barbaro, the aristocratic intellectual architect and philosopher, remain firm in posterity's mind through the apparently simple act of pausing from their scholarly pursuits to take a few hours to sit for Titian and Paolo Veronese. Thank you. <laughs>